Chris Doring is with us, and uh, he is on the SEC Network, the former Florida receiving great. You'll see him uh, talking about the Bama-Georgia game. We'll talk some about that with Chris coming up uh, in this interview as well. As uh, with all of our guests, Chris joins us on the Pepsi Hotline. Chris, people had waited for that Billy Napier hire. Who can go pluck him out of Lafayette? Florida did it. Like Jim said, look, there were some big names that kind of stole the thunder there of the Gators, but I think this is a fascinating hire to see how it turns out. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a a fascinating hire for a number of reasons. First and foremost, uh, how LSU and Florida, I think, will be forever linked, or at least in the near future, with the way that this hire went down. Uh, Supposedly no interest from LSU in regard to a guy that was right under their, their nose there in the state of Louisiana. Meanwhile, Scott Strickland seemed to have targeted Billy Napier from the get-go so much so that I'm I'm curious as to how much that actually accelerated the dismissal of Dan Mullen, knowing that there would be a lot of coaches sniffing around the guy that clearly Scott Strickland had the most interest in. And so I, I do think it'll it'll be a, a dynamic story to watch in the future, just how much uh, LSU is able to succeed with their their home run Brian Kelly hire versus you know, Florida going a little different route with a younger up-and-comer that has the great pedigree that uh, – Scott Strickland was clearly looking for in terms of his ability and energy to recruit his uh, his resume, having been at at Clemson and and at uh, Alabama and and, and what that should project to and and bringing Florida back into a little bit more relevance, particularly on the recruiting trail. Uh, Not that it matters because Pete Carroll, I think, was the fourth choice when he was hired at USC years and years ago. And fans were really upset about that hire. But where are fans on the Billy Napier hire right now? I think they're pretty excited about it. You know, I think a lot of people initially were were on the Lane Kiffin train and and you made parallels between Lane Kiffin and Coach Spurrier, both being considered very uh, ingenuitive when it comes to uh, offensive play calling and play design. Um, You know, a little bit of brashness from each of those guys, but I'm not sure how serious Scott Strickland was ever uh, looking at Lane Kiffin and, and kind of ironic, the guy that was rumored to be in consideration for every job has not necessarily... You know, been been one that we've talked an awful lot about for any of the job openings yet. So, you know, I, I think Florida fans were excited about Billy Napier, the young energy, uh, the desire to recruit. And I think, you know, for Florida fans, that was one of the biggest things that they griped about Dan Mullen even before this year was the unwillingness or or inability to recruit at the same level that some of the best were in in the SEC. You got to wake up every single morning with the desire to recruit as much and as hard as what Kirby Smart does. Florida's finding themselves in a a big uh, gap between where where Georgia's been able to recruit to and where Florida is. So goal number one has to be for Billy Napier, develop some relationships in the state of Florida and keep the top talent from leaving to go to Clemson, to go to Georgia, to go to Alabama as it has so frequently over the last few years. Do you buy into um, chasing the next Nick Saban? Because you hear that when you when – you, when you talk about Billy Napier, that he, you know, is the most assistant like Nick Saban. Um, that seems like that could be a chase that goes on for a generation at different places. H- hasn't that already been the case? I mean, everybody was hiring a Nick Saban disciple and trying to replicate the, the evaluation, the recruiting, the schemes. I mean, everybody has tried to, to take a little bit of that magic and recreate it at their respective universities. Nobody's really been able to do so with the exception of, you know, maybe, maybe Kirby smart and still that's left to be determined to some degree. So I, I, I think what you're looking for is a guy that can, can be himself that has been around great coaches that can assemble a great staff. I, I, I was having this discussion today with some of my friends. It's great to make nine, $10 million a year. Like some of these coaches are, but what's the dedication to the coaching staff pool? You know, who are you going to be able to go get, especially if you're a guy like Billy Napier, that's taking that next step up and, and, and job, stratosphere like the university of florida is you got to be able to surround yourselves with some good coaches particularly coordinators and so i want to know what the allocation for uh the coaches around billy napier is going to be at florida what kind of dog is that this is a uh, golden doodle man this Uh, is butters uh he was born in april uh he he, for some reason man i think i got one of the 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 calmest coolest golden (laughs) doodles like i'll I'll be doing radio in the morning from 8 to 11 in here and he'll climb up in my lap and sit there like he's a 10 pound lap dog is butters after south park 
Yeah, That's my son awesome. named him after uh, awesome. Butters from South Park, so <laughs> yeah. it's uh, kind of a cool little name. People, most, most people don't get the reference, but um, you, you South Park fans certainly do. It's awesome. Hey, so one of the reasons that uh, we're talking about the situation of Billy Napier to Florida was the inconsistency at the quarterback position. Um, is the future quarterback is 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 the guy there with Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson or you look at guys in the portal we were talking before you came on Spencer Rattler Dylan Gabriel there's some big time names out there yeah you know I wish I could tell you that I mean quarterback outside of you know what Kyle Trask um the last two years quarterback has been Florida's downfall since Tim Tebow left I mean it's been ridiculous to think about being the the flagship university in the state of Florida and not being able to hit on a quarterback and you you, you got yeah, I think that was one of the things that that led to Dan Mullen's firing is a lot of people thought he mishandled the quarterback situation. Whether he did or didn't is still to be determined because I think you got a guy that has a lot of upside in, in Anthony Richardson, athletic ability, you know, all the all the measurables, but doesn't necessarily um, have the ability to stay healthy. We've seen him, you know, get banged up, even dancing in a hotel, supposedly. Um, you know, you, you look at some of the mistakes he made this year. He was not clearly as uh, long as, as Dan Mullen would have liked. So how quickly can he pick up the offense? I honestly believe Emory Jones is probably, I mean, does he need a fresh start at this point in time? It's almost reminds me a little bit of Felipe Franks and how maligned he was before um, Dan Mullen got to Florida and kind of put him in a better position. So it'll be interesting to see how it works out, but I, I don't think you can ever have enough quarterbacks. I mean, as, as was evident Saturday night, in the iron bowl, you know, TJ Finley's out there hopping around on one leg and, you know, they, they got very little behind him. So I, I don't think you can, it's one of the most difficult jobs in college football with the transfer portal, the way it is and name image and like this. And those guys get paid so much as how you manage the quarterback position, but you, you got to have at least two good guys on the roster, if not three, because of how physical this conference can be. Uh, our farm folio chat room is raving about your Dr. J jersey in the background as well. Have you ever you. tried to duplicate the Dr. J dunk? Or was that your go-to? Well, I, I actually got that uh, jersey at Chris DeMarco's uh, golf tournament a number of years back in uh, in Orlando. And as you could probably imagine, had a few cocktails that night. So about two in the morning, I'm sporting the Dr. J jersey around the parking lot. You know, so that's as close as I've come to trying to replicate the dunk. <laughs> Chris Doring is with us. He is on the Pepsi hotline. And remember, for more than a reminder, for more than a century, Alabama Power and its employees have served our state. That's not all the Alabama Power, Alabama Business Charitable Trust. They work closely with community action agencies to help those in need all across the state. Learn more, alabamapower.com slash community, Alabama Power, power for a better Alabama. Give me the way Alabama wins this game Saturday over Georgia. Paint me a picture that gives Alabama a win. I mean, they, they've got to find a way to protect Bryce Young. That that That's the thing that stood out to me all year long. And, and you know, I was one of the first people to kind of talk about some of these deficiencies that have – and I got filleted by Alabama fans early in the season, as you guys may remember. But I, I think I, I feel somewhat justified with, with some of the things that we've seen from them. It, it's tough, man. That right tackle position has been an absolute disaster. Watching, watching Auburn get pressure with just their front four, it, it doesn't project very well for this week. And I don't know. It's not like you can go out and, and sign some free agent to come in and help you out. Uh, if, I, if, I was, if I was Georgia – you know, I, I would attack the edges of that offensive line, whether it's you know, right tackle or whether it's the, you know, attached tight end position. They haven't done very well of, of securing the edge there either. Um, so I, I, I think you saw Alabama just a little bit. They started running the ball, you know, taking advantage of some of the aggressiveness on the edge with um, those ends getting upfield and, and running underneath them. Um, I think you have to utilize some of the quick passing game. Uh, you'll see Georgia. I imagine play a lot of press to try to disrupt some of the, the timing between Bryce Young and John Mechie and Jamison Williams. Uh, I think that's the fascinating part of the game. I would love to be able to see what Bryce Young could do against this defense if he has the time. But, you know, having all the great talent around him like they do, it's a, it's a moot point if you can't protect. And, and, you know, when you look at the statistics, I didn't look at it after this weekend, but I know heading into the weekend, Alabama was – what 10th in sacks allowed, I think 11th in yards rushing. And those just are not Alabama numbers. So I, I've, I've talked about it the last couple of weeks. I don't think there's a more important, crucial position group in all of college football than the Alabama offensive line. Everything hinges on, on that group up front and whether or not they can 
they can protect long enough to let Bryce Young do what he can do because he's he's an absolute phenomenon. He's far exceeded what I thought uh, his his ceiling was going to be in year number one, and uh, can can't can't say enough about the, uh, the the pair of receivers and even Brooks stepping up you know, in, in Jamison Williams stead on Saturday. You know, we know Georgia's got an elite defense. Before Saturday, we all said Alabama had an elite offense. So so tell me if this question makes sense. Is Georgia's offense closer to Alabama's offense or Alabama's defense closer to Georgia's defense? I, I've been impressed with Georgia's – I mean, Georgia's offense does not have the explosiveness. Well, Man, that's a tough question, actually. Uh, looking at Brock Bowers run away from dudes the other day, now, albeit that's ACC speed, which is a little different than SEC speed, but um, watching him uh, you know, accelerate away from those guys, yeah, I've been impressed with the evolution of the Georgia offense, the, the versatility of it. I mean, I think they threw for 262 yards in the first half, and then in the second half focused their attention on running the football. That's their recipe for success. Build a lead. And then lean on the run game and, and the defense in the second half to, to shorten the ball game. Um, so I, I, I've, I would say probably if you look at the Vegas line, the over-unders at 50, I would say Vegas is probably saying that the, the Alabama defense is closer to the Georgia defense than maybe what the Georgia offense is to the Alabama offense. Interesting. All right, he is Chris Doring. Go follow him on Twitter, at Chris Doring, and uh, hear him on Sirius XM. See him on the SEC Network with Burnsy in the mornings as well. Chris, we greatly appreciate the time. Always fun talking with you. Yeah, great talking with y'all. Sorry for my uh, my technological deficiencies getting on here this, this afternoon. It's quite all right. Oh. Butter, butter's made up for it. Butters is the guy. Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right, see, see ya. ya. Chris Doring Bye. with us on the Pepsi Hotline. 